Do you like the metaverse? Because I like the metaverse, and I'm really excited that Virtua's Cardano Island is sponsoring this episode. Cardano Island is one of those projects I'm excited to have in our ecosystem. There are small, medium, and large plots, also condos, plans for four main sections, different zones and districts, fan caves to display NFTs, six different land resources, land bots, non-player character slots, slots for our Cardano Summit 2021 NFTs, other games, and lots more features. I bought a large plot on Cardano Island, and I can't wait to be on my land to see what this becomes. Check out cardano.virtua.com or click the link below. Lately, we've talked a lot about decentralization and security in the context of different staking protocols. Now it's time to talk about scaling. How do we actually service all those users and use cases if Cardano is as successful as we hope? One answer is going to be something I talked about back in Cardano Rumor Rundown number 177, the Layerverse. There will be layers of Cardano beyond L1, all kinds of side chains and L2s that make different trade-offs between scaling decentralization and security. We already have an EVM side chain that introduced wrapped assets to our ecosystem. Soon we'll also have a ZK rollup L2 to match what is all the rage in scaling discussions in the account balance world. But like I said, trade-offs. It's important to understand what you're giving up and what's still waiting for us on L1. Ready? Let's go. Today, we are going to discuss some of Cardano's different scaling options, both at L1 and at L2, the Orbis ZK rollups white paper that dropped today, and the Layerverse, and some of the different trade-offs that can be made there. If you had no idea whether this was a reference to the terraces looking like scales, or if it was all about the farmers scaling their agricultural production to cover the entire mountainside, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. Today, the Orbis white paper landed on Cardano Twitter. I know you're thinking, what is Orbis again? What are rollups? What are zero knowledge proofs? Let's go back in time just a little bit to find out. Wikipedia tells us that zero-knowledge proofs were first conceived in 1985 by Shafira Goldwasser, Silvio McCauley, yep, that same Silvio McCauley from Algorand, and Charles Rakoff in their paper, The Knowledge Complexity of Interactive Proof Systems. Okay, great, but what are they? A zero-knowledge proof is a method by which one party, who we'll call the prover, can prove to another party, who we'll call the verifier, that a given statement is true while the prover avoids conveying any additional information apart from the fact that the statement is true. So that that's a bunch of words, but what does that mean? I think you can get a better idea by looking at a couple of these abstract examples. So let's imagine we have Peggy the prover and Victor the verifier, and Peggy knows the magic word that opens this door in this cave. And this cave has two entrances. It's kind of a circular cave. I know this is kind of unlike any cave you've ever been in, but it's a circular cave with entrances A and B. She wants to prove to Victor that she knows the secret password to the magic door, but she doesn't want to reveal the password itself. And she doesn't want Victor to be able to record her so that he can prove to other people that she knows the password. So that sounds kind of complicated, but here's what's going on. Imagine that Peggy's afraid Victor might have like a camcorder. So she can't just do what would be obvious here. What would be obvious here would be for her to call Victor over and say, hey, check it out, Victor. I'm going to go down path B. I'm going to use my secret password to go through the magic door, and then I'm going to come out A, and then you'll know for a fact that I definitely went through the door. The problem is if Victor has a camcorder, she'll be conveying more information than just that she knows the secret password because then Victor will be able to record her and he could also prove to anybody else that she knows the password. Okay, so maybe that's not more information, but she'd be proving to more people than just Victor 
that she knows the password. So instead, what does she do? She doesn't let Victor see which one she goes down, but she goes down one, she uses the magic door, and then she lets Victor call out which exit she should come out. Of course, because she actually has the magic password, she's going to be able to come out the correct exit every single time. But you're saying there's only two exits, so it's really just a 50-50 chance. That's why they're not going to do it one time. They're going to do it like 20 times. And Victor's going to know, hey, she didn't know which exit I was going to call out, so she must actually be able to go to this door or there's a very, very high probability because for her to pick the correct exit, because I don't know which one she went down 20 times in a row, very, very improbable. In fact, Wikipedia tells us that in this example, the chances of her picking the correct side, given the 50, 50 odds each time would be like one in a million or something roughly equivalent to that. So Victor is going to know it's extremely probable. She actually has the password to the magic door here. What's great for Peggy in this scenario is that even if Victor recorded her coming out, coming out of the the correct exit all 20 times and then he played that video for other people trying to convince them that Peggy in fact does have the magic password at this door they won't be convinced because they won't know if Victor and Peggy actually staged the entire thing so if Peggy wanted to she could falsely claim that she in fact does not have this password even if Victor videotaped the entire thing because it always might have been staged between Victor and Peggy, but Victor knows it wasn't staged. So she was able to prove to him that she has, or at least to a very high probability that she has this password without conveying that same knowledge to anybody else besides Victor. Of course, that example required some interaction from Victor, but what if we don't want Victor to have to interact? In order to get this zero knowledge proof then we need to, then we need to think about non-interactive zero knowledge proofs these are zero knowledge proofs where the interaction between a prover and a verifier can be simulated by the prover by peggy making direct communication to the verifier unnecessary and making proof generation possible to do offline. Subsequently, such a proof can be sent and verified by also verifying that the simulation of the verifier was done correctly. So with non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs, Peggy doesn't have to communicate directly with Victor. The communication can be simulated, the interaction can be simulated by Peggy so they don't actually have to communicate. And of course, these are the famous ZK Snarks and ZK Starks we hear people talking about so much in crypto. ZK Snarks are zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge. And ZK Starks are zero knowledge, scalable, transparent arguments of knowledge. We won't go into the technical details distinguishing those two from each other right now. It's enough to know that the T in ZK Stark stands for transparent and it's all about not requiring a trusted setup for the zero knowledge proof to work so why are we talking about zero knowledge proofs again we're talking about them because everyone in the account balance world is talking about zero knowledge roll-ups zero knowledge roll-ups are layer two scaling solutions that increase throughput on ethereum mainnet by moving computation and state storage off chain ethereum.org tells us zero knowledge roll-ups zk roll-ups a bundle or roll-up transactions into batches that are executed off chain off chain computation reduces the amount of data that has to be posted to the blockchain zk roll-up operators submit a summary of the changes required to represent all the transactions in a batch rather than sending each transaction individually they also produce validity proofs to prove the correctness of their changes the validity proof demonstrates with cryptographic certainty that the proposed changes to ethereum state are truly the end result of executing all the transactions in the batch so you're probably aware if you follow this channel that one of the big problems in ethereum is that they've got this global state that makes sharding very difficult and you'll remember sharding was supposed to be a part of ethereum 2.0 and then they decided, hey, sharding with global state is very hard. Why don't we go after this zero knowledge roll up thing instead? Why? Because they needed to escape this problem on Ethereum L1 on the mainnet that 
they have global state and it's really hard to do anything really expensive to commit data to the L1. But if they do it all off chain in this ZK rollup L2, and then they use a zero knowledge proof to commit something to the L1 that they can then prove actually changes the state of Ethereum of the L1 in a way that executes all of the transactions from the L2, the ZK rollup L2 that are bundled up together, then they can do all the stuff off chain, make bundled commits to the L1 and still prove that those bun that bundled commit represents all the transactions that happened in the L2 off chain. Ethereum needs this. They've got global state on L1, which is very unwieldy if you're trying to scale on L1. Sharding isn't happening anytime soon, apparently. They need to scale at L2. ZK rollups are perfect. So what's the problem? If we come down here to the entries and exits section of this page, we can hear about how this actually works. And it might sound reminiscent of something we've talked about a little bit on this channel. They say users enter the ZK rollup by depositing tokens in the rollups contract deployed on the L1. Withdrawing from a ZK rollup to L1 is straightforward. The user initiates the exit transaction by sending their assets on the rollup to a specified account for burning. The contract does a bunch of things. Afterward, the contract executes the exit transaction and sends funds to the user's chosen address on L1. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? You deposit your assets in the contract, and then you get some of these L2 assets. When you're ready to leave, you send your L2 assets to the contract, it burns them, and then it'll send assets to your L1 assets to your chosen address on L1. This sounds a little bit like a bridge, a little bit different because we're not going between blockchains, we're going from L1 to L2, but the, the depositing of assets, the burning of assets, this sounds a lot like bridges. And bridges have been one of the biggest components in the robbery forest over in the account balance world so far. That's been a big center for exploits and hacks and all these kinds of things. Because you've got a contract where people are depositing probably large amounts of assets, L1 assets, and then you've got kind of this minting and burning of the L2 assets on the other side. This sounds like a lot of the bridges we've seen get hacked in the past, doesn't it? Back to Cardano, where today the Orbis white paper dropped. They say, we present Orbis. We outline the use of cryptography through the zero-knowledge proof encryption scheme to prove a set of transactions computed off-chain and verified on-chain. This sounds a lot like the Ethereum ZK rollups we just read about. They also say Orbis will introduce a new paradigm to blockchain scalability through a distributed power node network utilizing recursive ZK snarks. So ZK snarks again. So this sounds a lot like what we just read about in Ethereum. And certainly it was probably no small task to take this same sort of ZK rollup model and make it work in an EUTXO environment instead of an account balance environment. If we come down here to page six to the last paragraph, we see after a user sends money from their wallet to the Orbis rollup contract, Orbis creates that money on its ledger at the sender's wallet address. The money on L1 is then held in the rollup contract state UTXO. The money can be accessed again on the L1 only by following the Orbis L1 protocol. To remove the money from Orbis, a user must supply a signature which allows Or Orbis to prove that the user has authorized removing a UTXO at their address from the rollup. Orbis subsequently generates a transaction on Cardano that consumes the rollup state UTXO and outputs a new rollup state UTXO with reduced value in the same transaction. The value of the user's burnt on rollup UTXO is sent to the user's wallet address on Cardano. So again, we see a very similar mechanism, something that looks a little bit like a bridge, but instead of going between two blockchains, it goes from L1 to L2. Like I said back in September, the Layerverse is all about trade-offs. And you can see here, both in the Ethereum uh, literature about ZK rollups and also here in the Orbis white paper, the trade-off you're making is in custody in this case. In both cases, you have to deposit your assets from the L1 into the rollup contract. Obviously, this is the only way it's gonna work you're depositing your assets, so you're giving up custody. This isn't a scenario where you could like keep your assets on your ledger. You actually have to deposit them 
into the roll-up contract. So this is what you you expect. There, in order to achieve the higher level of scalability, you have to give up custody. You're not going to have that same level of security. What if you just kept your assets on your your hardware wallet? Because there's always the chance of an exploit of the smart contract. Of course, in Cardano, we hope our EUTXO Plutus Haskell based system results in higher security for our smart contracts, but it's a hope, it's an aspiration. We don't know yet. And there will be smart contract exploits in Cardano, those will exist. So if you're depositing your assets into these roll up contracts, there is a non zero chance of an exploit happening there. We already know a lot of people aren't going to hesitate at all, not even for a second, to deposit their assets in a contract like this. Why do we know that? Because people do it every day in DeFi. They want to engage in LPing and farming, and they'll deposit their assets in contracts just like this one's going to be all day without worrying about it at all. For myself, I'm unwilling to deposit any amount of my ADA anywhere that I care about. If it's an amount of ADA I care about, I don't deposit it in any smart contract because I know exploits do happen, hacks do happen, and I'm unwilling. So far, there hasn't been any any dap that surfaced that has made me want to take that risk. But a lot of people will. They might want to achieve, you know, the scaling that's enabled by a zk rollup L2 like this. And whatever they think the risk of an exploit of the roll-up contract is, it's within their risk tolerances. But if depositing your assets in a contract like this is not inside the bands of your risk tolerance, there is something else still coming to us that also involves scaling that won't involve depositing your assets in a smart contract like this. You might remember back in the Cardano 360 for April, we got a very straightforward explanation from John Woods about input endorsers. He explained that currently we have a block every 20 seconds that does the work of both consensus and containing all the transactions. But in input endorsers, we would still have this block every 20 seconds that does the work of consensus. But in between those 20 second blocks, we would have a flurry of blocks just containing transactions. Charles has described this in the past as sort of being like a heartbeat every 20 seconds. Boom, boom, boom. With input endorsers, we would still have that 20 second heartbeat, but in between would be this flurry of transaction blocks. Boom, 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 boom. So we wouldn't have to wait for the 20 second consensus and transaction block to send transactions. We could just be sending transactions all the time, which John Wood said would result in a super fast L1. He said, we don't even need the speed right now. We're just planning for the future by creating this super fast L1 that gives us more scaling than we currently need. Granted, Input endorsers isn't here yet, but it sounds like input endorsers will get here at some point in the future. And given the way John Woods has described it, we may get input endorsers before we even need it. It sounds like at least that's the plan. And that's on L1. It's interesting to note here that the consensus blocks will reference the transaction containing blocks with a pointer. So it's almost like having some kind of rollups right on L1. And we won't have to subject ourselves to smart contract exploit risk by depositing our assets anywhere. I think it's both inevitable and desirable that Cardano has a ZK rollup L2. For every layer in the layerverse, there's a different trade-off that could be made to each of the legs of the blockchain trilemma, including security. And where we have all these different trades in terms of security, we're going to have different choices for people with different risk appetites. But you know me, I'm over here like Patrick Henry, give me custody or give me death. Hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you tomorrow.